Hi. Today I want to let you know that um, our June newsletter is coming out today in your inbox, served on a pl platter, on a plate to you in your inbox. So watch, watch out for it. It should come at around 1 p.m. Um, British summer time in your inbox. So the theme, main theme of this newsletter is how to recognize and enforce judgments after Brexit. Indeed, since the UK has uh, left the European Union as a member state on the 1st of January 2021, there's been um, some vagueness and blurness as to how UK judgments would be recognized and enforced in uh, the 27 remaining e EU member states and how EU judgments would be recognized and enforced in the UK. And the system is um, really in a state of flux. There's no certainty at the moment as, what, as to what is going on because the uh, UK has applied to become a member of the uh, Lugano Convention in order to be able to, um, like the um, countries which belong to the um, EFTA, EFTA, the European uh, something association, so that covers Iceland, Norway, Denmark, um, uh, Liechtenstein, etc. So all these EFTA countries, except Liechtenstein, are uh, contracting parties to the uh, Lugano Convention and as such, um, as well as the EU, the 27 um, remaining mem EU member states are part of the Lugano Convention, so therefore these EFTA members, Barlach, uh, Liechtenstein and um, the uh, EU member states can actually have their uh, judgments recognized and enforced in their respective jurisdictions easily through the Lugano Convention. So why does the UK um, take time to become a member of the Lugano Convention? Because the UK is fucking about, excuse my French, by not applying the provisions of the new TSA, uh, uh, basically um, the new agreement which uh, it entered into between the EU and, um, and the UK and in particular in relation to the Northern Ireland um, trade barriers which are not being um, basically implemented by the UK at the moment. So this is creating a row and therefore the, um, this TSA, this, this, uh, um, this, this agreement between the UK and the, and the EU is not implemented in full and because the EU has taken the view nothing is agreed until everything is agreed well that also covers the accession of the UK to the Lugano Convention which the EU can veto if it wants um, and um, I'm fairly sure that the um, accession of the UK to the Lugano Convention for the recognition of uh, an enforcement of civil and commercial judgments uh, will be put on hold until the um, enforcement of a TSA, so this new agreement between the UK and the EU, is uh, is actually um, un uh, basically enforced and um, and um, complied with, in particular by the UK. So, another avenue to recognise and enforce judgments from the EU into the UK at the moment is to look at common law from England and Wales, from Scotland and from Northern Ireland. Yes, you've heard me correctly. At the moment, the judges, the courts in the UK have to rely on common law um, in their respective, um, you know, regional jurisdictions. So the common law of England and Wales, common law of Scotland, and common law of Northern Ireland, which is like, you know, a return to the Dark Ages because common law is extremely vague, right? Common law is a pool of uh, case law which has accumulated over the years um, in, in these three uh, uh, British regions uh, or, or areas, uh, England and Wales, Northern Ireland and, um, and Scotland. 
So um, in addition to common law applying to the recognition and enforcement of uh, civil and commercial judgments in the UK, there's also the desire of the UK to use the Hague Convention from 2007. So the EU uh, is a party to a contracting member of the Hague Convention on the um, on exclusivity, uh, exclusivity clause agreements. And um, as such, when the UK was a member state, a EU member state, the UK was a party to the, uh, the Hague Convention. And so what the UK did before the transition date of the 1st of January 2021 is that it applied to become a, um, a standalone member of the, the Hague Convention to 2007 which was granted to the, uh, to the UK. So the UK became a uh, standalone uh, contracting party of the Hague Convention 2007 um, on the 1st of January 2021, which is great. But there are two areas of contention in relation to the application of the Hague Convention to the enforcement and recognition of civil and commercial judgments in the UK. Why? Well, first, there is the um, difficulty that this Hague Convention relates to exclusivity clause agreements, i.e. simple agreements which set out a, um, a clause which provides an exclusive jurisdiction of a particular country, um, which needs to be a member state of the Hague, in order to enforce such um, such. Um, uh, court decisions which will re relate to the dispute. However, there are quite a lot of uh, contracts um, entered into, in particular in the UK, which, as we all know, is a, is a, um, a, um, a financial hub um, with a lot of banks um, uh, located in the UK. There are a lot of uh, contracts, particular banking contracts, lending agreements, which are asymmetric, i.e. one of the parties, one of the uh, contracting parties of a contract has an exclusive uh, uh, clause relating to the jurisdiction applying to it, while the other party, um, in, usually the lender, um, has the ability to choose the, the forum, the, uh, the jurisdiction um, which will be uh, uh, competent in case that there is a dispute and a court case which has to be filed. So it is, these contracts are called asymmetric because for one party it is a, um, a exclusive clause jurisdiction which applies so it's usually the borrower but for the, um, for, uh, the other party, i.e. the lender, uh, it is a, 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 they have a, a choice of uh, the various types of um, jurisdictions that they can elect to uh, uh, look into, into the dispute uh, 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 you know, in court. So the UK has taken the view that these asymmetric contracts or these unilateral contracts are actually falling within the remit of the Hague Convention 2007, the 2007 Hague Convention on um, exclusive uh, jurisdiction agreements. Uh, while the EU and a lot of case law and a lot of academic, academics have decided against those asymmetric contracts, uh, being covered uh, uh, by the scope of the uh, 2007 Hague Convention. So here, this is probably going to be, at some point in the near future, discussed and, um, de and um, decided in court. Uh, so that is not great, you know, in terms of security of uh, transactions and um, basically clear, clear and transparent um, rules applying to the um, enforcement and, um, and, and recognition of uh, civil and commercial judgments between the UK and the EU uh, states. Another area of contention relating to the um, application of the, Hague, the 2007 Hague Convention is the fact that um, the UK was not a standalone contracting party to the Hague Convention between 2015 and 2021. It was just merely one of the 28 EU member states um, and was a member of the um, Hague 2007 Hague Convention by way of its uh, membership as an EU member state. And while the UK is of the view that uh, this, the UK has been a contracting member of the 2007 Hague Convention 
without any um, interruption from 2015 when the EU became a member to um, now, up to now, you know, with no interruption because on the 1st of January 2020 when it became a standalone contracting party of the Hague Convention, the EU on the other hand is of the view that uh, between 2015 and the 1st of January 2021 the UK was not a party to the Hague Convention and therefore that is probably another uh, legal issue which is going to be resolved at some point in the near future in court. What is the uh, take out of all this? It's a fucking mess. That is the take out. It's a fucking mess and nothing is sure and certain and clear and transparent at this point in time. So what do you guys as a creative entrepreneur, as a, you know, as a, um, you know, a director of a creative business, as a creative person, what can you do with your uh, upcoming cross-border contractual relationships with your uh, 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 trade partners uh, who are based in the EU? Well, the best is actually to set out an arbitration clause in your um, new contracts going forward, uh, w w which uh, basically is the best way forward. Why? Because arbitration awards are um, recognized and enforced through the 1958 a New York Convention, which was unaffected by Brexit. Okay, why? Because the UK was a contracting party to the uh, New York uh, Convention even before the transition date of the 1st of January 2021. So for arbitration awards, there's continuity in the way they are being enforced and recognized in the UK um, and um, in the EU. And also London in the UK, and I mean London in particular, is one of the strongest forums for arbitration proceedings with Paris uh, in particular, but, but uh, London is also quite strong with the LCIA, uh, some, uh, a portion of the ICC, etc, etc. So at the moment, our recommendation is for our clients and creative partners to actually set out a, an arbitration clause in the new contracting um, agreements, in the, in the new contracts with um, the EU trade partners or with the UK trade partners if they are based in the EU, which will um, force the parties to actually start an arbitration uh, which will be concluded by an arbitration award which will be easily enforceable through the, um, the New York Convention. That is the best way forward to use actually this private uh, alternative dispute resolution mean, which is arbitration at the moment, because on the public uh, stand standpoint, on the public law standpoint, with as I, as I was explaining, with the, the Hague Convention, the Lugagno Convention, using UK common law, I mean, hello, this is a return to the Dark Ages and nothing is sure and certain. So this is the takeout. Bye for now.